Hi, everyone. I'm Debbie Roberts, owner and financial advisor at Property Apprentice. Join us today for the Week in Review, where I talk about current events for the everyday investor and home buyer. Our topics for this week, first up from landlords.co.nz on the 5th of September, house sales rise more than 50% on a year ago. Second topic from News Hub on the 6th of September, election 2023, an economist reveals how National's tax plan could tempt property investors to sell. Third topic from One Roof on the 6th of September, Tony Alexander, why young first home buyers are suddenly under pressure. Fourth topic from landlords.co.nz on the 4th of September, not a huge market for foreign buyers. And fifth topic from CoreLogic on the 6th of September, three things to know about a national government and property investors. So first up, from landlords.co.nz on the 5th of September, House sales rise more than 50% on a year ago. Barfoot and Thompson, Auckland's largest real estate agency, reported increased home sales last month compared to the previous year. In August, they sold 879 properties, marking a 20.9% rise from July, a 22.1% increase over the average monthly sales from the preceding three months, and a substantial 52.1% surge compared to the same month in the year prior. Peter Thompson, the Managing Director of Barfoot & Thompson, sees this as a positive signal for the recovery of the Auckland housing market. The median sales price also saw a 3.4% increase from July, reaching $982,500. Thompson pointed out that while these results represent a modest step forward from where the market had been, buyer motivation was at its highest level in over two years. He anticipates increased sales activity after the general election in October, leading to a steady market for the rest of the year. This market recovery is expected to manifest through increased property transactions rather than significant price hikes. The agency's average sale price stood at $1,088,457, which is a 2% increase over the previous three months' average of 0.9%. New property listings in August rose significantly, with 1,577 new listings, marking a 30% increase from July and a 13.1% rise compared to the same period in the previous year. By the end of the month, the agency had 4,155 properties listed, providing buyers with a wide range of options. Furthermore, the market saw a resurgence of properties selling for under $500,000 due to an increasing number of apartments for sale, coupled with the market downturn experienced since November 2021. In August, 18.7% of sales were of properties below $500,000 which is clear evidence that you can buy property in Auckland below 500 grand, while 6.4% were above 2 million and 2.4% were above $3 million. The rural and lifestyle property markets also experienced increased buyer activity in August, with sales worth over $58 million. This marked a 70% increase compared to July, and listing activity grew in anticipation of a more active market post-election. Meanwhile, realestate.co.nz reported positive signs in the national housing market, with rising average asking prices and stable new listings after a 10-month period of year-on-year -year reductions. Demand has increased and confidence is returning to the market, with more people searching for properties and a rise in homes listed for auction. Eight out of 19 regions across New Zealand saw year-on-year -year increases in new listings during August. However, a lack of new listings over the past 10 months has reduced the overall pool of available properties for buyers. National stock declined by 10.6% in August, the second consecutive month of double-digit year-on-year drop in stock numbers. This trend reflects the slower market where it takes time for existing stock to cycle through due to the lack of new properties coming onto the market. Despite a slight year-on-year -year decline, Average asking prices have been increasing since March this year, indicating a potential recovery in the property market. The West Coast region reached a 16-year record high in August, while Central Otago Lakes District saw prices decline after reaching a peak in July. 
Overall, the property market is showing signs of recovery with growing demand and rising prices, suggesting a positive outlook for the future for people who own property. Second topic this week, we've got from News Hub on the 6th of September, election 2023. Economist reveals how National's tax plan could tempt property investors to sell. A property economist believes that National's proposed reduction of the Brightline test duration could entice some property investors to sell their properties earlier than expected if they are exempt from capital gains tax. Recently, National unveiled a $14.6 billion tax relief plan that involves reprioritizing spending and introducing targeted revenue measures. As part of this plan, National intends to shorten the Brightline test from the current 10 years to two years. Under the current rules, individuals who sell residential properties they've owned for less than 10 years may be liable to pay income tax on any profit from the sale. This rule also applies to tax residents who purchase overseas residential properties. Calvin Davidson, Chief Property Economist at CoreLogic New Zealand, suggests that a shorter Brightline test duration could attract property investors looking to buy or expand their portfolios. The reduced risk of facing a capital gains tax if they need to sell within a shorter time frame may appeal to some investors. Davidson notes that some existing investors might be grappling with cash flow issues due to higher mortgage rates and may be hesitant to sell because a capital gains tax bill could worsen their financial situation. If they were suddenly exempt from this tax, it might lead to additional property listings and sales. Under National's proposal, the foreign buyer ban would remain in place for all houses worth less than $2 million, and a 15% foreign buyer tax would be introduced for houses worth more than that. While it's challenging to estimate how many foreign buyers might be attracted to New Zealand, Davidson suggests that approximately 3% of the country's housing stock has a value of $2 million or more. The impact of the shorter Brightline test could be more pronounced in areas popular with foreign buyers, such as Queenstown, where around 10% of the properties have a value exceeding $2 million. This increased demand could exacerbate existing shortages of properties at affordable prices in these areas. I think it is important to point out that there's also this thing called the intention test. What that means is that if you purchase a property with the intention of selling it, that triggers GST and tax on profit because you'd be deemed to be in the business of buying and selling property. Therefore, you're taxed like any other business. That rule's been around for as long as I can remember. The original two-year Brightline tax was very good at catching actual speculators, otherwise known as property traders or flippers, who were trying to dodge the GST rules. In my opinion, extending the Brightline tax to five years and then 10 years This is simply a capital gains tax by any other name. The irony is that it also had some significant unintended consequences, which we've heard a lot of in the media recently. For example, people who are unable to live in their home for whatever reason for more than 365 days, then they'll be required to pay a percentage of the capital gains if they sell their home within 10 years of purchase. The additional irony is that statistics show that the majority of property investors actually hold their properties for 10 years, whereas homeowners tend to sell their homes on average approximately every every seven years. For this reason, I think reinstating this two-year bright line will return the rule back to its original intention and less homeowners will be caught by the unintended consequences. Property investors are not speculators. Property traders or flippers are, and they already pay about half of their gross profit to inland revenue by way of GST and tax on profit, because they're in the business of buying and selling property. If you'd like to learn more about investing in property, join me at one of our free events, How to Succeed with Property Investing in 2023. I'll discuss strategies for successful investing from my perspective as a financial advisor, and these are available live online or in person. Check out propertyapprentice.co.nz for upcoming dates and register today. We don't sell property, so it's all about increasing your knowledge to reduce your risk. If you've already been to one of our free events and you'd like to find out more about how we can help you to reach your financial goals, you can also book a no-obligation phone call or meeting with my husband, Paul Roberts, via the website also. 
That's propertyapprentice.co.nz. Third topic this week in review from One Roof on the 6th of September, Tony Alexander, why young first home buyers are suddenly under pressure. The housing market is experiencing a surge in activity, particularly driven by young first home buyers. At the beginning of this year, a survey of real estate agents conducted by Tony Alexander indicated that a net 3% of agents were witnessing fewer first home buyers in the market. However, the latest data reveals a significant shift, with a net 66% of agents now reporting more young buyers entering the market, marking the highest level on record. This increase in young buyers is underpinned by several key factors. Number one, increased property listings. The number of properties listed for sale has risen to nearly 25,000, compared to fewer than 14,000 in mid-2021, providing a wider selection of homes to choose from. Number two, stronger deposit positions. Young buyers have had the opportunity to build up larger deposits after staying out of the market for approximately two and a half years. Factors contributing to this include robust wage growth, that outpaces the cost of living and high job security. Number three, more affordable house prices. House prices on average have decreased by 17% compared to late 2021 levels, making home ownership more accessible. Meanwhile, rents have continued to rise, altering the purchase price to rent equation in favor of buying. Number four, shift to existing properties. Buyers have temporarily shifted their focus from ordering new construction to exploring existing property listing. This change is due to concerns such as cost escalations and project non-completion that have caused some individuals to lose their deposits. However, demand for new properties is expected to return potentially late next year. Easier credit access. This is number five. Recent adjustments to loan-to-value ratios, or LVRs, and the Credit Contracts and Consumer Finance Act, or triple CFA rules, have made credit more accessible. Additionally, various schemes from Kayanga Ora also provide additional support. And number six, perceived peak in mortgage rates. There is a belief that mortgage rates have reached their peak, although the accuracy of this view remains to be seen. However, there is now an added sense of urgency among young buyers. Political opinion polls indicate the potential return of investor interest expense deductibility over time, which may bring more investors back into the market. Furthermore, there's growing awareness that while some young Kiwis are leaving the country, many foreigners are arriving, increasing demand for rental properties and encouraging more people to purchase homes. Additionally, concerns are mounting about the availability of property listings. In a monthly survey of real estate agents, only 9% of agents in January said buyers were worried about listing availability. By May, this figure had risen to 25%, and then in July to 46%, and now in late August stands at 54%. This growing concern adds to the fear of missing out or FOMO among buyers. The housing market is on the upswing with young buyers taking advantage of favourable conditions. The sense of competition is intensifying as potential changes in tax policies and increased foreign demand contribute to rising prices. Young buyers are seeming to recognise the urgency to act swiftly in the current market landscape. Fourth topic for this week in review from landlords.co.nz on the 4th of September, not a huge market for foreign buyers. ResiMac New Zealand's General Manager, Luke Jackson, doesn't anticipate a major influx of foreign buyers in New Zealand's higher-priced housing market if the National Party wins the October election. Even if they do enter the market, there's only approximately 50,000 properties priced at $2 million or more. The National Party plans to relax the ban on foreign buyers, permitting them to purchase properties valued at $2 million or more, subject to a 15% tax. This policy aims to generate $740 million in annual tax revenue. Jackson believes that the market won't see a similar frenzy observed before the 2018 foreign buyer ban imposed by the Labour Party. He recalled heightened competition in certain housing sectors, particularly involving wealthy Chinese buyers outbidding locals in Auckland's suburban areas. 
However, foreign buyers accounted for just 3% of the market, primarily high socioeconomic Chinese individuals looking to diversify their assets. Economic conditions have since changed, making it uncertain whether similar dynamics will occur. The new rules may increase property prices in areas like Queenstown, where 10% of properties exceed $2 million, potentially exacerbating existing affordability challenges. Despite tax implications, the $2 million plus bracket comprises only 3% of properties, which aren't considered super prime, but expensive. Chinese buyers may be less active due to a property sector slowdown in China, impacting consumer spending. National's tax revenue target of $740 million would require foreign buyers to acquire nearly $5 billion in in New Zealand property, raising questions about the feasibility of these figures. CoreLogic's Calvin Davidson expects more foreign investment potentially influencing properties valued around $1.8 million to reach the $2 million threshold. While looser rules may attract more foreign buyers, the impact on New Zealand's property market remains uncertain. The primary concern is their effect on house prices and sales, with experts advising caution about overestimating the scale of change. One thing for sure is that it's unlikely to affect the first home buyer market in any significant way, as there are very few first home buyers who'd be house hunting in the $2 million price bracket. Fifth topic for this week in review from CoreLogic on the 6th of September, three things to know about a national government and property investors. Many current and prospective property investors are closely monitoring election developments, specifically whether the national parties can secure leadership in the next government. This outcome would entail the reinstatement of mortgage to interest deductibility for all properties, a reduction of the bright line test from five or 10 years to two years, and a softening of the foreign buyer ban. But what ramifications might these changes have? This analysis by CoreLogic's Calvin Davidson delves into the potential impacts of these housing and tax policy shifts. Number one, the bright line test. The prospect of a shorter bright line test from July 2024 has garnered significant attention. Some investors might be enticed to make their first purchase or expand their existing portfolios due to reduced capital gains tax risk within a shorter time frame. Conversely, some current investors facing cash flow challenges may abstain from selling for a few months until they're outside of the two-year bright line period to avoid substantial capital gains tax liabilities, which could potentially result in increased property listings and sales after July 2024. Number two, foreign buyers. The possibility of foreign buyers acquiring New Zealand properties valued at $2 million or more, subject to a 15% tax, introduces uncertainty. While it's difficult to estimate the exact number of foreign buyers targeting New Zealand, Only around 3% of properties have a value exceeding $2 million. However, the shortened Brightline test might increase the allure for foreign investors, particularly in areas popular among them, like Queenstown, where roughly 10% of properties exceed $2 million. This additional demand could worsen the shortage of affordable housing. It's important to note that National's projected annual tax revenue from foreign buyers is $740 million, a figure that may be overly ambitious given current property sales data. However, it's also important to note that current property sales data actually reflects a slump in the property market over the past couple of years. It's not a typical picture of the number of properties sold. And if the property market continues to show signs of recovery, the figure that National has projected could also turn out to be pretty accurate or even potentially understated. Time will tell. Third point is interest deductibility. The potential phased reinstatement of full mortgage interest deductibility, that's 50% this tax year and financial year in 2025, 75% interest deductibility in financial year in 2026, and 100% tax deductibility from financial year in 2027 and beyond, might not trigger a rush of investors entering the market. This change may not significantly impact investment decisions due to existing issues such as the gap between rental yields and mortgage rates, 
resulting in substantial weekly top-ups. However, I'd also add that 50% tax deductibility is a heck of a lot more than anyone's currently getting when they purchase an existing property. So that, to me, sounds like a pretty good incentive, especially when it would continue to strengthen over the following few years. This would return property investment back to the same position that any other business faces, where you can claim the interest on loans. So just to clarify, the removal of tax deductibility did not close a tax loophole for property investors. It was a tax specifically designed to discourage property investors from purchasing existing properties. And look at what's happened to the rental market because of that. Increased market rents caused by reduced supply and increased demand because the rental returns on new builds tend to be much lower than an existing property, not to mention the impact it had on property investors who'd purchased property prior to the rule change, who were then faced with significant tax bills as well as rising interest rates. I mean, no wonder some investors were forced to sell, which had that unintended consequence of and further imbalancing the supply and demand of rental properties, which caused rent increases. So more unintended consequences caused by poor policy. Elections typically don't have a profound and immediate impact on the foundations of property investing. And from our experience, understanding the principles and following the correct strategy for your situation always works out, no matter who gets elected. If you want to learn more about the property market, join one of our upcoming free events called How to Succeed with Property Investing. As a seasoned property investor and financial advisor, I'll be sharing valuable insights and expert tips to help you on your journey. And it's not just how to invest in New Zealand in 2023, it's 2023 and beyond. Whether you're thinking about buying your first home or if you're already an experienced investor, there's something for everyone at our free events. I'll also tell you more about how we can help our clients achieve their financial goals. So if you're interested in finding out more about what we do, visit propertyapprentice.co.nz today to secure your spot and register for our events. And again, if you're already a client of ours and you want help and further direction with your portfolio growth, feel free to reach out to your coach. It's a lifetime coaching program after all. Alternatively, you can book a no-obligation phone call or meeting with my husband, Paul Roberts, to find out more about how we could help you if you're not already a client of Property Apprentice. So get in touch with Paul via our website, which is propertyapprentice.co.nz. Thanks for listening.